Welcome, everyone. Really excited to have you guys at the, I guess, third now uh, commercial real estate 101 meetup. Uh, really, the, the objective of these meetups is to enlighten people on the commercial real estate realm. I feel like a lot of times uh, people just kind of don't, they don't necessarily know a lot about commercial real estate. I mean, residential real estate for the most part has always been, has been explained a lot and a lot and a lot, but I'd really like to open up uh, an understanding of the commercial real estate market so that more people feel comfortable whether they want to buy per commercial property, lease commercial property, or sell commercial property. They feel a lot more comfortable with the entire situation. So uh, today I'm really excited to invite uh, Nick Grisanti. He's a, he's a real estate agent with, with our, our brokerage uh, he's been in business for, uh, what, four or five years now, and he has a ton of experience. And so I thought I'd invite him in to kind of talk about the, uh, the commercial real estate brokering process. Um, so welcome, Nick. Really excited Thanks to have you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, man. Really excited. So, so to start off, I mean, generally when we start some of these meetups, we, we like to ask uh, them to tell us a little bit about themselves. Like, tell, tell me a little bit about your background and what got you into real estate in the first place. The, uh, the job I was doing before I got into real estate was working with the Kentucky Economic Development Cabinet as a project manager on the business development team uh, for the cabinet. And that job was basically, basically looking at <clears throat> trying to recruit companies to come to Kentucky and, and get companies to grow that were in Kentucky. Um, and whenever you hear about companies uh, getting incentives to expand or to locate jobs in a state, uh, that's, that's the economic development cabinet that's handling that. Um, of course, it, uh, every, every state has a different, you know, a, a, some agency does that. It may necessarily not be the economic development cabinet, it might be the commerce department, or it might be a public-private partnership, but in Kentucky, it's handled by the economic development cabinet. So I spent three years doing that. And that job was similar in a lot of ways to real estate. Um, you know, people hear about uh, the incentives, the incentives kind of make the news, but really what you do has a lot more to do. There's a lot of other aspects of that, of that gig than, than just incentives. You're working with communities on basically making the state look attractive. So you're helping companies find sites, find buildings, find workforce and, and put all the pieces together to make a project work. And then oft oftentimes the incentives is really just kind of the icing on the cake. So in a lot of ways, there's similarities to real estate because I mean, for one thing, you're just finding sites and buildings for companies and you're, you're basically solving problems that they tell you, we want to, we're either going to locate in Kentucky or Indiana or Ohio, and you have to put your best foot forward much like you would with a listing, you know, you're putting your best foot forward with any given listing, trying to attract that, that tenant. Um, or, uh, you know, a lot of times you're, you're going around with a, a company that's looking at multiple sites in the state of Kentucky. And that, in that sense, you're kind of acting like a, a buyer's agent or a, or a tenant's agent in that sense. And so I learned a lot about real estate doing that, that, that job at the state, you know, on you know, concurrently, uh, while this was going on, my father, had a brokerage in Louisville and ultimately just decided that um, it made sense for me to go into business with him as, a, as opposed to continuing with the state. So it was just a good fit and it was kind of a good training ground to, to make a, uh, a leap uh, into real estate and really hit, hit the ground running uh, with a lot of the contacts and knowledge that I had gained uh, while working with the state. So I did that in 2016. And so it's been, um, yeah, four years since I got into commercial real estate. That's awesome. Yeah, and just so you guys know, I mean, Nick has really been a, a, a big mentor to me, helping me out on a lot of deals that I've been working just over the last year. So he definitely has a lot of knowledge and super competent in what he does. So I definitely just wanted to point that out. But as far as the commercial brokering process, can you talk a little bit about maybe the, some of the benefits of, of utilizing a commercial real estate agent? And not only that, but maybe also walk through uh, the process, a typical process, and I use the 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 asterisks a little bit, just because you really don't ever have a typical type of transaction when it comes to commercial real estate. Every transaction is slightly different, but 
you can maybe elaborate a little bit on that, as well as some of the benefits of utilizing a commercial real estate agent when you're looking to lease or buy a commercial property. Yeah, I think the biggest thing that an agent you know can do for a for a seller or for a buyer is is simply help navigate the pitfalls of of deals because deals can fall apart for so many different reasons um, that having agents involved that have a lot of experience in understanding and kind of seeing a couple steps ahead where problems may lie is really the the benefit of having an agent and, and also market knowledge is really critical um, if you if a company comes to louisville and let's say they need um you know hundred thousand square foot building a uh, hundred thousand square foot um uh, industrial building and they've never put a you know never done a lease in in in, in this market before well if they just call up that landlord or they call up the sign uh, out front or whatever and, and, and start talking to the landlord, they may not understand what the going market rates are for, you know, what it, what can they expect to get on a tenant improvement allowance for that, for that build out? What should they expect to, to get from a, you know, is the asking rent reasonable or is the landlord want too much for the type of building they have? Uh, so that in, in the same, in the same market knowledge is also goes into play when you're helping assess uh, uh, a seller of a property, you know, helping them understand, you know, that's, that's similar to like a, what a residential agent would do is you have to know the neighborhood you're selling in. In this case, you have to know the, the asset class and the, the market. And of course, every asset class is a little different. Some, you know, it's a broker specialized in things, office, uh, office, industrial, uh, investment, land. Uh, you can do it. You can dabble in multiple asset classes, which, which our company does. Uh, but, um, you know, having that local knowledge is really critical for brokers. So, yeah, I think it's the local knowledge and it's navigating, you know, navigating where, deals can go off the rails and being that buffer between the, the buyer or the tenant and the landlord or the seller, I think is the, the biggest key that, that agents, uh, you know, where, where brokers come into play. That's awesome. Yeah. No, and I echo that sentiment as well, but as far as the, and you kind of talked about this slightly as well, but what are some of the common pitfalls? And we'll, we'll talk about it both on the business owner side and the investor side, because each, each type of person is going to have similar pitfalls, but also some different pitfalls. So if you kind of want to elaborate a little bit on the business owner side first, so what are some of the common pit, pitfalls that you see business yeah. owners face when they're looking to either buy or lease a space? Yeah, and, and it might be helpful just to think about one type of asset because it's, it can be different in, in every in every type of asset, you know, the, the things change. So I'll just think about for now, let's just use the example. Let's say you are, you are buying an industrial property, a vacant industrial property for your company to own and use as an owner occupant. Now that's a very specific thing. I mean, it, you know, you can make it. Uh, so there's so many different types of transactions that can happen, but in this case, the broker should have good knowledge about uh, directing their buyer on how to go about environmental due diligence on that property, how to go about getting the property inspected, and whether that means using a generalist like a, like a building inspector or whether the building is too complicated for just a building inspector. You know, in the home business, you get these inspectors that come out and kind of give you a broad strokes. Yeah, things look pretty good or there's some there's some issues there. If you're inspecting a industrial building that was built in multiple sections and you know has been expanded a couple times and the first section was built in 1970 and the second section was built in 1985 and it's had roofs put on it multiple times. A, an inspector that's a generalist is probably not the best person to go look at that building. So if you're advising that buyer on that property, you're going to want to have a good roofer, a good mechanical contractor, possibly a structural engineer, depending on, uh, you know, if the building up front, you know, looks like it may have some, some structural issues. Um, so there's getting through the due diligence piece of any, any project requires a lot of knowledge about 
what, uh, you know, about the building itself. Um, if, if there are any, um, you know, issues with sometimes users want to want to you know, add curb cuts or add things to the, to the roads, you have to be able to work, uh, you know, help them get in touch with a good civil engineer for things like that. So, you know, it, it ranges the gamut from, you know, as an agent, we typically just kind of act like a quarterback between bankers, lawyers, engineers, environmental consultants, um, and the list goes on. And so really it's, it's, it's bringing in the right experts because typically as an agent, you're a little bit of a jack of all trades and that you have to kind of know enough about all the different things that could get in the way of, of a closing or getting, and it's not just the closing, it's the, it's the user's ultimate utility of that building, which is the most important thing. You can't just worry about getting the closing table. You got to make sure the building is actually good and functional for them when they act when they go down to buy it because you are acting as their fiduciary. Um, and it's it's kind of knowing all the pieces. So those are the typical uh, the typical players you're you're getting involved as needed, depending on what issues might arise. You know, lawyer, engineers, and that could be structural, could be civil, could be mechanical. Um, uh, 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 bankers, of course, the, the buyers are going to be working with a, most oftentimes a, a lender and then, um, you know, environmental consultants, uh, geotechnical consultants who might be needing to go out to that property and bore to make sure that it's, you know, there's stable footings. Um, so you, you, yeah, you learn these things along the way. There's really no roadmap that tells you, you know, these things. It's just, it's really something as an agent, you, you almost learn by doing. And there's resources like CCIM and, and other uh, commercial classes that can help you understand, but a lot of it's just, you know, experience. For sure. So yeah, one of the, I, I, like, you, like you said, I think one of the biggest things uh, that are common pitfalls are just the due diligence part of it. Just making sure that you got all your ducks in a row so that you're not surprised at the end of the, the, the transaction, whether that's you're buying or leasing a property. And then all of a sudden you're kind of, yeah point of no return yeah. and i skipped right through the contract part i mean you would only do all this stuff once you had a property under contract so of course getting the property under contract you know is its own can of worms you know you have to you have to be competent in drafting an offer um you may depending on depending on that on that buyer and depending on that seller um in some cases, it's kind of a, a template type contract that you submit, and there, it's it's relatively straightforward. In other cases, you're you're dealing with uh, you know a thirty or forty or fifty page document that an attorney has drawn up, and uh, you know, and that's where you got to start being that quarterback right away and getting those getting the, the buyer. Um, to engage an attorney if they don't do that automatically and say we need some outside counsel because, you know, this contract is, you know, is getting, <clears throat> is at a point where, you know, it's, it's a, it's a document that, that needs a legal eyes. Um, you know, in some cases you'll go to, you'll, typically the offer comes from a, from a, from a buyer to a seller. Uh, some sellers will tell you, just send me the basic terms. I'm drafting the off. I'm drafting the contract. If you if you if you go to buy a property from a large institutional seller, more often than not, they will want that contract to be on a contract they are familiar with, rather than the rather than the buyer presenting them with a with a contract. So that process typically starts with just some basic a basic term sheet or a letter of intent coming from the buyer, and then the seller will furnish their contract. That's when you really say to the buyer, it's, it's lawyer time. You know, you, you've got, this is, a, this is a document that the seller's attorney has drafted. They've probably done 50 deals or 100 deals with it. And, you know, we've never laid eyes on it. So it's time to get an attorney involved to, uh, to review this thing, to protect, to protect you, uh, to make sure that, um, you know, you kind of, that you that we can get this prop you know property under contract and in a fair and reasonable way um, that makes that makes it fair for you to get to the closing table um, 
without, you know, without too many stumbling blocks. Definitely. So in, in the case of, of leases, uh, this is something that I've faced a lot as far as dealing with business owners that, that are unfamiliar with, with how leases are structured, in particular when you're talking about commercial leases. So can you tell me about maybe some of the provisions in a lease agreement, in a particular commercial lease agreement, that may be detrimental to a business owner if they're not careful about how they interpret what's being written? Um, you mean the, 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 the user, the, the, the tenant? Correct. Yeah. So, so in the case where, where, I mean, in most cases, uh, these commercial leases are often going to favor the landlord. So, I mean, okay. maybe you can talk about some of the, some of the provisions that you've seen in your experience that, yeah. that, that sometimes are overlooked by the business owner and how mm -hmm. that can cause negative ramifications. Uh, yeah. Down the road. yeah, I can certainly, the landlords can and occasionally, you know, get one over on their tenant, if you will. But I've seen, I've seen just as many cases where, where the landlord has something that is completely unfavorable to them. And I'm always shocked when I see something like that. It's like, how did that ever get in your lease? Like you're, you, that, that's a really, <laughs> that's a really bad position to be in. Um, on that point, I'll, I'll, I'm, I've got one on top of my mind for a bad position that, uh, that, I'll, that I've seen a landlord in where, I've seen landlords have deals where they give a tenant like all these options. An option is if a tenant says, I want to extend the lease, it's the tenant's option. The landlord has no control, control that. If the landlord agrees to give a tenant an option, an extension option, and then the tenant is in control in that situation, they can exercise it if they want and extend the lease for however long that option states at whatever price that, is, that option states. And if the tenant doesn't want to extend it, then they can back out. They can they can just stop the lease whenever the current term expires. Um, so I I remember seeing a, a lease deal one time where the the tenant had like four or five year options, and the landlord had no way of stopping that really. And, and let, if the tenant continued to extend those, extend that. They could, but every, you know, but every time that the, the term came up, the tenant could back out of it. And so, you know, as a landlord, you might want to give a tenant one or two options, but if it's just a continual, continual string of options after options after options, um, if they don't have any rent escalators in them, that could be something that's really uh, detrimental to a landlord. On the flip side, uh, tenants need to be aware of escalations, um, automatic escalations, especially because if a tenant has an option, they can just they can just say, "I don't want to exercise that option. I want to renegotiate." Let's say you have a five-year lease with a five-year option, and the market's completely changed after the original five-year term. If you're a tenant and you like the space, but the, the, the five-year option is too expensive, it's it's the tenant's option to exercise that. So they can simply say, I'm not going to exercise that. I'd like to stay for three more years at this term and just renegotiate it on, you know, at that point at the end of the five-year term. Um, and so that's, you know, that, that helps the, the tenant have flexibility. The landlord, they are trying to get as long of certainty as they can with rents increasing for as long as possible. So a landlord's always going to want, you know, typically they're always going to want the longest term. And as that term goes on and on, you're gonna, they want rent bumps because they need to keep up with inflation. So that's something that would be very, you know, it's always, that the landlords always try to get is escalations, you know, whether it's every two years, five years, one year, um, escalated rent throughout the term. Um, Tenants, if you're a tenant, you want to put in your lease the provision that you can sublease that space uh, if you back out or if you, not that you back out, you're legally obligated to the lease once you sign it. But if you, if your business needs to, you know, needs to downsize and you need to get out of space, the tenant would like a option to sublease that space to another tenant. On the other hand, the landlord will probably always want oversight over that subtenant. And so 
that's the give and take that you usually see. I rarely see landlords that say, absolutely no way will I allow for a sublease. But I rarely see landlords agreeing to a blanket provision that says the tenant can sublease to anybody they want. Usually that has to go through the landlord with an approval process and says, yeah, they're the equal quality to you as a tenant. And I don't, I, you know, I, I want them in, you know, they, I approve of them taking over uh, your space. I had a deal that fell apart late last year where I had, I was representing a tenant who was trying to be a sub landlord and sublease their space out and the master landlord rejected their sub tenant because they simply said, this sub tenant doesn't have the financial wherewithal uh, that you do as a, as a tenant. And so they, they refused it and they had the right to do that uh, per the lease. But you know, leases are totally custom. I'm almost every time you do a lease, I mean, it's going to start with a template that, that somebody's drafted up, but they get, they get pretty customized pretty, pretty quickly. So every, every deal is, is very different. Yeah. No, no, no. And I'll say one thing on top of that, uh, just actually with a deal that I was working on right now uh, with a international grocery store that we're trying to get under lease. Uh, one of the provisions within the lease Pass along the responsibility of some of the major mechanicals to the tenant. Uh, and, and so that's another thing that you kind of see in some lease provisions is that the landlord tries to pass along some of those major responsibilities to the tenants. When let's say if, if, if an HVAC system goes out, you're, you're kind of SOL where you got, you got to pay five or 10 or sometimes even more thousand dollars to be able to replace the system even though you may or may not have been occupying the space for the duration of the time that that was operational. So that's probably one of another ones that I've seen uh, yeah. where if you're not careful, you may get stuck with that responsibility. And I mean, your, your business may not be able to take that big hit if something like that were to happen. But yeah, like you said, I think commercial leases are so, so diverse. So it's, it's always good to kind of carefully review the lease and make sure that um, you cross all your T's and dollar your I's uh, through that process. Yeah. Essentially, both sides in the course of putting, doing a lease and negotiating a lease are, it's, a, it's, a, it's an exercise in risk mitigation. Both sides are looking at that document saying, what is my exposure? And if something breaks, if something goes wrong, if the tenant leaves, uh, if the building burns down, all, every, every discussion you know, once you, once you hash out the basic business points of how long the lease is going to be and what the term is and when the escalators are going to kick in and things like that, everything beyond that is, is, is basically this is a negotiation on risk exposure. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's kind of the name of the game is how, how, how do you, how does, how does a tenant keep their potential cost as low as possible? And a landlord's looking to do the same thing, keep their potential cost if things break and go bad. Um, as low as possible to put as much responsibility on the tenant as possible. So now, so now we've talked a little bit about the business owner side. I thought we'd talk a little bit about uh, on the investment side, because I mean, I've dealt with a decent amount with investors the last year or so that I've been in the business and definitely gotten some questions related to the, the, the purchasing process over the last uh, year. And so if, if you could talk a little bit about maybe some of the common pitfalls that you see investors, uh, face when they're either purchasing a, a commercial property um, or, or maybe some assumptions that they make about the process that may be inaccurate. Yeah, the, the, for an investor, the most important thing is verifying the data that the, that the seller provides. Um, you're basing that investment uh, on information about the income and expenses of that property, uh, you know, as if you were buying, uh, you know, any other sort of financial instrument. And so if the data is bad, then, and you, and then a, an investor, you know, takes ownership of that property and somehow that data on income and expenses has been fluffed or, uh, you know, future expenses have been, you know, future costs have, you know, been delayed and you don't discover those big, you know, those big money pits, you know, that are coming up down the line in your due diligence process um, or big, you know, possible holes in your, in your leases with tenants, uh, then, 
those are major issues. So if you're going to buy a property, you, know, you absolutely need to, and it's an investment property, review the leases to make sure, you know, to understand uh, exactly how solid they are. Are there any um, detrimental situations to a landlord? You know, I think we did, I think, I think um, I discovered that situation with that long, uh, that long option tail that one tenant had you know, on an investment property. And it was like, they could get out of it at almost any time and yet tie the landlord up and be in that space at a really cheap rent almost indefinitely. And that's not a great situation to be as a landlord. You know, a lot of times as a landlord, you might be better off kicking out the current tenant and renovating the space and raising the rent. But if they can sit and tie you up and just be there forever at a really low rate, then uh, that that's that affects the value of that investment. Um, so really it's all about the data. And a lot of times, um, landlords especially local and you know you might want to call them like a mom and pop or just a, a landlord that's not very sophisticated is not going to keep very good uh, it typically i mean it, some do and some don't you just you don't know what you're going to get but but in many cases the the uh the books if you will just are not very well kept and the landlords may be self-managing or you know kind of baking in other expenses you know i i sold a self-storage property one time where you know the landlord handed us a set of books and then he was telling us kind of how to spin them to to the investors because he said yeah these are this is this is what the IRS thinks are my expenses on this property but they won't be that's not what their expenses are going to be because I've got my mom's cell phone baked in and, and I'm paying you know my and all these things he starts telling us about all these different expenses that he's running through his self storage and so those are the types of things you have to be aware of and it can potentially be a really good deal for a buyer if you find that situation where the numbers maybe don't look as good as they really could be because the the seller is uh, just not managing it very well or intentionally keeping the keeping the profits low uh, to keep their uh, you know to keep their taxes uh, taxes low. So yeah, really digging into the into the the, the finances and the revenue uh, of of a investment properties is the most critical thing. It's absolutely the most critical thing. And it's in evaluating the property, the building, the site to make sure that you are accounting for upcoming expenses, right? That thing's got two, you know, a couple of bad HVAC systems or a bad roof. I mean, you got to know about that because that's going to be a direct hit to the bottom line once you take ownership if, uh, if you're immediately spending 30 grand on a roof or whatever. So, um, yeah, those are the biggest those are the biggest issues with with investment properties. Yeah, no, I hundred percent agree, and 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 I know bankers can attest to this is when you don't have clear financials, they kind of get nervous as, as as it pertains to financing too, right? Yeah. Because bankers are very conservative by nature, so they they kind of yeah. want to have all the ducks in the row before they start uh, issuing loans. So as as an investor, making sure that all those things are aligned, you make sure you verify all that information and. And like Nick was saying, the due diligence side of things, making sure that you've got enough in reserve so that you can account for any issues that go forward. I think that's that's crucial. And it's interesting too, because we had uh, we had Brian Hennessy, who's a commercial broker in LA speak a few weeks ago at one of our meetups. And he talked about the entire due diligence process and walked through the financial analysis, the lease analysis, the, the due diligence part, everything. So it really just that whole process as a, for an investor is just crucial. Um, and then also now that we've talked about, I guess, the, the investor side of, of acquiring an asset, once you have the, the property, uh, as, as, as a landlord, kind of, you touched on this a little bit, what are some of the lease provisions that, that are in a lease that, uh, really can benefit a landlord to have in there with, with in order to try to maximize what they, the, the, the returns they achieve from the property? Mm -hmm. Um, well, every landlord is, is, would like to try to put as much responsibility, you know, onto the tenants as possible. But in some cases, that's just not what the market expects. So if you're an office landlord and you have an office building and, and these office tenants scattered throughout it, that's not a situation where you could even really try to push the, um, you know, you're going to, you're going to be offering that space at a gross amount so that, um, you know, if it's, if it's the, if the, the lease is quoted at $25 a square foot gross, 
the tenant is paying the, you know, that amount that the tenant pays includes the utilities, it includes the operating expenses of the building, it includes the taxes, it includes the insurance. Um, so, you know, that is something that the landlord has to factor in when they quote that, that base rate. Um, so one thing that I see when with gross leases, you know, let's say if it's a triple net lease and the expenses go up, triple net meaning the, the tenant's paying a, a, a quoted rent rate and then also paying 100% of the operating costs above that rate. Um, if it's, you know, let's say it's an industrial space and it's $4 a square foot, the tenants are going to pay, be responsible for another buck or, you know, $2 above that on, on the taxes, insurance, um, uh, common area ma maintenance, and all operating costs. And the landlords are just going to pass those through, you know, uh, every year. If the, the tax bill goes up, the tenant just gets a higher bill. If the insurance goes up, the tenant just gets a higher bill. Um, and let's say if it's an office situation, the rent is going to be quoted as a gross amount. So one thing that you're almost always going to see is the landlords, even though they're giving in an, an office or, re, or retail, even though, well, really retail is typically triple net, but in an office, which is almost always gross, they're going to baseline that first year. And they're still going to find a way to claw back or to get money from their tenants if they're in, if they're, if their rent or their operating expenses increase, even if their tenant is quote unquote paying a gross lease. So the landlord will say, in year one, your rent is $25 a square foot, all in. You know, that includes your the rent, that includes the utilities, that includes the OPEX of the building, that includes the taxes, that includes the insurance. But this may not always be your your total but your total rent because in year, if you sign at lease in 2020, 2020 is your base year. And if the taxes, insurance, and all that stuff starts ticking up, then the tenant or the landlord will send that tenant a uh, reconciliation statement and say, now you owe us $25 a square foot plus 50 cents a square foot, uh, or whatever the, you know, what they're just going to break it out on a pro rata share. They're going to say, you know, we're, uh, you know, the building is, X number of square feet and you're leasing X number of square footage. And so here's your pro rata share of the increase over your base year. So the, in that case, the landlord needs to have a sophisticated management system to have all their tenants tracked as far as base year, base years, and then be able to, to, to keep up with when increases over the, each separate tenant's base year happen that they can then bill those tenants appropriately. Otherwise, as a landlord, as an office landlord, especially, you can get way behind um, if you're if you're gross. Um, if you don't have a way to to uh, increase your billing, you know, increase your opex uh, uh, billing to your tenants. So that's that's a very important thing for for an office landlord that's offering gross leases to be able to have in the lease. Definitely. Yeah. And I mean, like you said, I mean, the value of an investment is based on the income it produces. So the way you can increase the value of the building is either increase the income or decrease the expenses. And in the case of the landlord, you can decrease the expenses by, like you said, uh, having a base year stop, essentially, that allows you to over to charge the excess amount to the tenants once you achieve that, uh, once they, if, 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 for example, the expenses go up. The consumer price index is another one that's kind of interesting is that I've seen in some leases, you can tie the, the increase in rent based on a consumer price index. So if the cost of goods in market goes up, then you can see an increase, a corresponding increase in rent based on that index. Um, and then, I mean, you can also have the rent, rental escalations like you were saying. So there's, there's various different ways that investors can kind of get into a lease agreement or structure a lease agreement in a way that can maximize their best interest over time. So yeah, yeah. I had a, I had a landlord one time. We were just, we were negotiating uh, annual rent bumps, and they said we could either. They said after five years we want to bump. You can either bump it. Uh, we'll either accept a CPI and a, I think they offered either annual CPI bumps or. For a year, it was an eight-year lease, and for years six, seven, eight, that it would go up 
would, it would jump 5% from the base at, at year five and then 6% from the base at year six uh, and so on. And so we looked at what the CPI was doing and CPI, you know, it's no guarantee that it's going to stay flat, but I think that tenant ultimately decided to take the, the locked in uh, 5%, 6%, 7% over base for those years rather than CPI. CPI, you know, it's pretty low right now, but if, you know, you could get to a situation where it's, if it's jumping, you know, 2% a year, you know, you're going to be, you would have been 10% higher after five years as opposed to 5%. So they, that tenant locked in the certainty there, um, you know, and, but that you're right. There's there's just different ways to structure how you how you account for inflation and cost increases. You know. Definitely. All right. So we've gone over the business owner side. We've gone over the investor side. And now I thought we'd address kind of the current situation as we're recording this. Uh, we cur we currently are in the the COVID pandemic still. Uh, things are starting to open up a little bit. But I thought if ask if you could provide some insights i mean obviously no one knows what's going to happen over the next four or five six months however long but if, if in your eyes what, what do you think the outlook is post COVID 19 maybe from a six month period and then all the way to maybe a 24 month period how it all plays out yeah just to give you some insight into the current situation that you know i find myself in and our broker finds herself in I've got one deal that's going to close soon and one deal that just died because of COVID. And every deal I've had that was under contract before coronavirus has been delayed in, for some reason due to coronavirus, whether, whether that is financing and the banks moving slower and, and just totally starting things over in some cases with the lender or with the borrowers. Uh, some have been delayed because... Uh, like planning commission and zoning and variance meetings and things have been delayed. Um, so the deal that we just had that fell through was actually a dentist was buying the property and uh, his bank, because dentists have been, uh, you know, essentially shut down by the stay home, by the state's stay at home orders, totally put the brakes on his borrowing process and essentially said, his practice needed to restart the clock. They needed to see two two new months of revenue post reopening to to evaluate his credit worthiness as a borrower. Um, and we were coming up against some deadlines, and that borrower or that that buyer just you know decided to cancel the contract uh, rather than extending it, uh, extending the due diligence period. So six months from now, twenty four months from now. You know, I, I have seen an increase of activity over the last couple of weeks. I think the American consumer is uh, irrepressibly, maybe stupidly optimistic sometimes. <laughs> There's 40 million people unemployed, but God bless us. We just like to keep going out and spending money. So, and it does seem like the stimulus has worked in, in a lot of, you know, it, it's doing it's doing its job. I mean, retail sales buoyed in, in May over April. And so that extra federal money that unemployed people are getting is, is helping keep the economy afloat in a lot of ways because the unemployment numbers are pretty staggering uh, compared to where we were. I don't know when that tails off, when, when that money, if they don't renew that uh, federal uh, $600 a week unemployment supplement, um, I, I don't know what's going to happen. I think there could be a pretty extended hangover from all this where things just kind of trudge along, but at a, at a slower pace than where we were in 20, 2018, 2019. Um, but then again, you know, I'm surprised where we are now compared to where we were two months ago. There, there's definitely a lot of people out there looking for property. And um, I think in six months is the time where you're gonna start seeing some distressed assets hit the market. And there's a lot of money on the sidelines. Uh, people that work in the, the really big capital markets, um, you know, that, that, that work with, you know, big institutional REITs, the term they love to throw around is there's a lot of dry powder, you know, and, that, I get, and they mean by that there's money that's just sitting on the sidelines that has been waiting for, waiting to come gobble up these assets. I mean, think it, it's kind of the, 
on a commercial scale what Blackstone did with houses after 2008, 9, 10. And they came in with their quote unquote dry powder and just started buying massive amounts of single family homes and became the biggest, you know, this huge hedge fund became the biggest re uh, landlord, residential landlord in the country. And so I think there are going to be big buying opportunities as uh, retail centers that, that are, you know, full of restaurants and other places that, that, have, that are, that are going to start closing um, as the longer this malaise and this hangover um, from coronavirus drags on. So, you know, in that sense, while there might be, there's going to be kind of temporary stress and, and you're going to see places like restaurants and and other small mom and pops go out of business. Um, and not just mom and pops, but bigger companies. You know, you're seeing some layoffs in Louisville and things like that, some, some bigger companies laying off people. Signature Health, you know, laid off 100 people. They're a large outfit. Um, but at the same time, there's there's gonna be investors and there's gonna be people coming in to, uh, to snap up those properties. So, you know, I think in our business, hopefully opportunities will continue to be there for, for transactions. Um, but 24 months from now, you know, I think we're probably, you know, I think two years from right now, things are going to look pretty much, uh, they're going to look pretty good. I think we'll be in a, in a similar situation that we were like mid 2019, you know, just chugging along, asset prices will stabilized and, you know, who knows if we'll have a, if a vaccine by then or not, but, you know, I don't know if that, I think that's probably irrelevant. People are going to be operating probably similar to they are now where they're going to be kind of aware and cautious of coronavirus, but you know, you're going to have daily cases are probably just going to be kind of trucking along at a very steady, but hopefully by then, you know, low pace that just sort of underlies things and, and uh, you know, people will just kind of learn to live with it. Okay. Well, well, thanks, Nick. I really appreciate all, all the insights you've been able to provide. And what, what I'll do now, since we had ex exhausted, I guess, the, the predetermined questions, I thought I'd open it up to questions from the audience. And uh, one, actually, we have a question on Facebook uh, from June. Hi, June. Um, so with commercial property where the landlord wants to sell the property, have, have do you know landlords, uh, have you seen a situation where landlords start off leasing to a tenant on a monthly basis until they're ready to buy. So similar kind of like a lease option type of situation. Uh, yeah, that happens. I mean, that, that certainly happens. Um, um, it, it, it kind of depends on the asset. You know, typically you might see that in a situation where the, you might get a landlord that, uh, I've seen this a couple of times recently with industrial type companies or like contractor, mechanical type, you know, maybe mechanical contractor or building contractors where I've talked, uh, talked to owners or agents that have properties where the, the original owner of that business decided to get out of the business and sold the business to some employees. And those employees may not have the cash right away to, to buy the property as well. So that, that landlord, you know, the, the business owner who owned the building would act as the landlord for a little while. And then as those people who bought the business from them got on their feet and got, you know, uh, got the financial wherewithal to buy the building, that would be a good situation where, you know, kind of a lease to own, uh, lease to own situation. I have never personally worked on a lease to own where it's like a third party uh i you know someone says i want to lease this and then eventually own it and the landlord or the seller jumps at that opportunity i hear it proposed pretty often by cash poor buy you know cash poor group you know buyers slash tenants that say well they do lease to own but i can't say i've ever had a landlord do that so i don't know how often it actually happens i think the the times you see it more often are, are there some existing relationship there, like I said, where they're buying the business or something. Um, <laughs> it's funny how often I get the question, but I can't say I've ever done a deal like that. Yeah, I've, I've had a similar situation just a few weeks back, actually, where we were with, with uh, the Manslick property. It's like an office building. Yeah. It's 
I had a few people approach me about doing something similar where it was like yeah. a lease to own option. And, but yeah, I mean, from a landlord's perspective, a lot of times it's like, well, I mean, you, you essentially, like you said, a lot of times it, it comes from people who are not necessarily in the best financial footing. And this is either their first go at it or, you know, because if, if they had multiple locations and then maybe that's not an issue for them as far as lease to own goes. So, but yeah, you're right. I mean, I think that it's, it's out there, but it's definitely not as common as um, the question you get, right? So. Yeah, it's a complicated transaction. You have to figure out, you know, who, how much of that, lit, does any of their rent apply to the towards down payment or is it all just rent? And then they got to come up with the full price of the building when they, when they go to buy it. I, you know, there's a lot of moving parts and both sides have to agree on, on what that, what that looks like, you know. All right. You guys have any questions? If you want, you can go ahead and type it in the, the comment box, or the chat box, and we'll go ahead and uh, ask it to Nick. Um, hey, Nick, I've seen this a few times. Have you seen it where they do a lease with an option to buy afterwards, though? In other words, stating the fact that you sign a five-year lease, and then if the seller wants to buy, they get first right of approval. Yeah, first right yeah. Approval. That's, yeah that's, a good, that's a good... Uh, that's a good point and something I probably should have mentioned in the leasing in, in just discussion of general leases too, rights of first refusal, whether that's to buy the property or to lease any adjacent space on buying the property. Yeah. If, if a, you know, if someone, especially like a single tenant user, um, that's a, that's a really good thing for, for the, to negotiate in there as a, uh, from the tenant standpoint is have a right of first refusal so that they, if that landlord, goes to sell that as an, let's just, you're just gonna sell it as an investment property with the tenant in there. And typically what that'll look like is something like the tenant or the landlord would have to present that tenant with a valid offer, like a signed valid offer that's, that someone says, I'm willing to pay, you know, however much, 500,000 or whatever it is for this building, that would trigger some sort of response period by the tenant who has the, the right of first refusal, the right of first offer, uh, to then match that, and then being in that, then then that kind of jumps them into that pole position. Um, like I said, that's also something that tenants typically want on adjacent spaces in uh, in buildings as well. If there, if it's a multi-tenant building, uh, you would want to get a right of first refusal so that. If you needed to expand, let's say that you know you're side by side with the tenant, you both have 100,000 square feet and a 200,000 square foot building, and you're busting at the seams, and your neighbor goes out of business, you want to be able to expand. Now, the, the landlord's typically going to come to you and 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 give you that first option anyway as a as a uh, a landlord because you're the path of least resistance, right? You just go knock on the next door neighbor and say, "Hey, do you want to take this?" But but it doesn't always work that way. Like I had a deal once where a group took uh 40,000 of a 60,000 foot building and very early on the landlord got another tenant for the remaining 20,000 and I don't think they had any I don't think they thought that my tenant was going to exercise their right of first refusal because they hadn't even finished building out the 40,000 square feet but my tenant said uh we want to protect our expansion capabilities and they jumped on in and, and leased the whole building, you know, eight months after they leased two thirds of it and hadn't even finished the build out. So, um, you know, the landlord, I think was a little surprised that they did that, but that's, you know, why you want to want to rofer is, is if, if you really feel like you have this opportunity to grow, um, you don't want to get boxed in, but yeah, good for both leases for leasing and purchasing situations. I've seen deals where, you know, uh, sometimes sometimes people, I've seen like big land developers, people that develop big tracts of land will pay for rofers on adjacent properties. They'll give a property owner, let's say they don't want to buy it. Let's say the neighboring property is eight acres or something. And they don't want, they don't want to spend a million or $2 million or whatever it's going to cost them to buy that right, right then. Uh, but they'll give, they'll, they'll pay, you know, they might pay $10,000 or something for the right for the, and, and just put a right of first offer, a right of first refusal on that adjacent track with the current owner and say, if you ever get an offer for that, you have to bring that offer to me and I have a, I have a right to match it. So, so that if, 
if whenever you get that offer, it could be five years after they put the right of first offer in place or right of first refusal in place, um, they can't be boxed in by by somebody else or by another developer. So yeah, interesting, interesting stuff. Awesome. Do you guys have any questions re regarding the, the the process itself or? Okay. Well, thanks, Nick. I really appreciate you coming by and, and talking about this. Uh, I know it's one of those subjects that, that doesn't get a lot of airtime. So I think that being able to kind of elaborate a little bit on the brokering process and some of the some of the, the, the questions that we went over today has been very valuable. So I really do appreciate you stopping by. Uh, as far as people wanting to get a hold of you, if they have any questions or anything like that, do, do you want to kind of tell people how they can reach out to you? Yeah, we don't make ourselves hard to find. Hopefully, uh, grizzantigroup.com. All of our all of our information is there, and uh, yeah, I, we try not to be too too con, you know inconspicuous. So um, yeah, we're easy to we're easy to get in touch with. So yeah, just grizzantigroup.com. Google my name, and I'll come up. But thanks for you know thanks for taking time to listen to me yap. I mean, I'm I'm an expert of four years. So all that means is I've had four years of experience there or maybe a little more if you count the, the economic development stuff and uh which means i'm not an expert at all other than you know just i learn new stuff about this every day and uh try to absorb as much as i can so yeah i mean you've been you've been part of some pretty pretty decent sized deals so i mean you've, you've learned a lot uh, along the way and so I, I mean we just really appreciate you coming by and talking a little bit about that so great well thanks again guys really appreciate you guys stopping by and uh, like I said, we're going to be recording this, so it's going to be on YouTube in the next uh, day or so. So look out for that. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Thanks guys. We'll see you. All right. Thanks, guys.